Okay, so uh, we're going to start the proceedings for today. We're going to, uh, the first session is going to be a slightly uh, innovative experience. We've never done this before in NetDev, to the best of my, uh, my recollection. We have uh, a panel here of people who attend this thing called NetConf. And uh, how many people here know what NetConf is? Okay, we'll find out during the course of this talk if your understanding of NetConf is, has any bearing with reality. That's the point of this particular session. We're going to have these panel members explain to us a little bit more about NetConf and basically the role that it serves and why we are doing some of the things that we are doing here this way. So to get the ball rolling, we're going to do a rapid fire introduction set. And we're going to start with Jesper on that end and speak two, three sentences about you, what you work on, what are the key things that you focus on, and pass the mic along. Hello. So uh, I guess I have to speak up. Yeah, but I, I, I'm Jesper. I work for Red Hat, given the kind of obvious Red Hat I'm wearing. I'm mostly working on uh, optimizing performance in the kernel. And that I guess I started out in networking, and for the but networking use cases, the memory allocator was too slow, so I moved into the memory allocator because I thought the, the memory people were not giving me enough speed, so I sort of had to fix up myself. <coughs> So the thing you have to know about Jasper is that uh, he takes things to the nth degree of dissection. Like he, he specializes in taking something and actually understanding everything about its history, its geography, its uh, neighbors, and everything else you need to know about it, and then come up with something that's uh, pretty darn good most of the time. Thank you. Hi, I'm um, Jamal. Uh, uh, my focus mostly is on TC at the moment, but I've, I've handled in many other places, anything from, I could probably talk about any part of the network code, uh, and I, I'm all over the place, I guess. And the thing you have to know about Jamal is that he will talk about every part of the network code, if you give him a chance. Uh, I, I'm sorry, a moment. Uh, I guess I, I started off with the network code uh, doing load balancing. Now, with these days, I mainly focus on hardware upload. Yes, uh, I think that's too succinct. I don't have anything to add to that. All right, uh, my name is John Festerman. I work on mostly DPF and LCP things uh, recently. Uh, in the past, I've worked on uh, uh, 802.1Q and uh, drivers and uh, Judas players and uh, various other working things. Hi, I'm Eric Limaze. I'm working at Google since five years. And my so I'm mostly a networking guy, and my focus is probably TCP stack at this moment. Focus is uh, too, too broad a word. Uh, some people call me a network ninja, but yes, <laughs> yes, there is a, there's a rumor that he is a ninja, but no one can confirm that because that's how ninjas work. Um, Okay, so the way we're going to do this, now that you know generally what they are, I have a few preformed questions. What I would strongly encourage is audience participation, right? So uh, the goal would be to get to a point where everybody has a fair amount of understanding of what happens in this thing called NetCon, where a lot of the structural el elements of what will be emphasized, what will be focused on in the kernel is, is sort of decided for the next n number of weeks, months, hours, whatever. So uh, to encourage audience participation, what I would like is there's a couple of mics out in the audience. Please ask questions. If you are not comfortable, write a note, send it up here. I'll ask them for you. Of course, then we'll tell everybody who asked the question, and then that anonymity will be lost. But ask questions, make it a little bit more interactive. So to kick it off, question number one, and we're going to have this open to all panelists one by one, and we'll do it in reverse order because it's the most efficient way to traverse a link list that's already been traversed. Um, what is NetCon to you? Uh, and, and you have to answer the question as if David Miller is not here. <laughs> so the NetCon is uh, usually two days uh, back to back with uh, NetDev, and this is where we have good conversation and good beers. <laughs> and we try to not. Uh, <laughs> because we will be away for the 
following day. So, so you would say that the thing that you most remember about NetConf is the beer. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. A good point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, that's, it is two days, true. <laughs> uh, other than this, we tend to talk about kind of current issues and um, what people are working on sort of long term. So it's sort of helpful from that standpoint uh, versus just seeing patches in the list. Uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of the people working on the network uh, stack on located in different places. Uh, we had to get to see each other and so on. So. It's a good chance to have face to face, a quick uh, discussion about you know, people bring on problems they have and looking for solutions and maybe pro propose a few solutions and get some, some you know, like instantaneous feedback from a high level focus group. Um, discuss problems that are unsolved and try to, to, to come up with solutions and so on. It's just a nice way to, to get together once or twice a year and the rest of the time we're at the at the other end of patch queue or something other than that. I can also confirm it's two days. <laughs> well, to me, I think, uh, well, number one is an opportunity to get to have a good attention from David. Uh, but problems do get solved, actually. I showed up there with a problem on our tool, and there was David Ahern sitting, and he inflated my ego because he already had solved it. So uh, some, some questions are made very difficult to do over email. And so uh, the format is people present, uh, half the time there's no slides. You just present and other people understand and nod along and will correct you or give you advice. It's the best place to uh, solve difficult problems in my opinion. Uh, you get face to face, you get attention, there's no crowd milling around, uh, melding of the minds. I don't, I don't know if I can add that much, I have already covered enough, but I think it's, it's very important that we meet all face to face once a year, because it becomes unpersonal. Yeah. Things go much smoother after you have had a couple of years, right? You don't want to get too much to my practice anymore. So, so the summary statement is that it's all about collaboration and being able to actually do things in person that are sometimes gnarly, sometimes have religious debates, sometimes um, leads to divergent thought that needs to re reach some sort of conclusion. And and those things can be sorted out. Um, as a special bonus for this question, maybe we'll ask Dave if he has something to say to this. No comment, he says. There's no opinions. Or, oh, you can, you can relax the pretend Dave is not here part of it. I like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, then, we'll do this now again back in reverse. And I remind the audience, if you have questions, like, why didn't this thing get discussed in NetCon? For was this discussed in NetCon. This is the kind of place and time to ask those questions. But we'll do this in reverse now. So pick uh, a, a thing that actually was useful. So maybe like give us, give the general audience a little bit more of a flavor of that, like a particular topic that got discussed and maybe got discussed and got discussed and got discussed. And then something good came out of it at a NetCon that you've attended. Doesn't have to be this one any time in the past. And while Jesper is on the spot. Yeah, actually, I was going to say, whoever wants to go first, go first. You don't have to do it at all. Uh, yeah, so at this uh, particular NetConf, uh, earlier this week, we discussed uh, the flow dissector. The flow dissector is a piece of uh, the stack that uh, ex extracts uh, parts of the uh, packet and puts them in the structure. Um, and this has become more and more complex over time. Uh, there was a decision made a few years ago that uh, all users of this kind of functionality should just basically call into the same function. And this function has grown, and this has been a, a point of contention on the mailing list uh, uh, over time, and it's, it's sort of become worse. And at the NetConf, uh, <coughs> earlier this week, we discussed this issue, and uh, people voiced their concerns, and other people voiced uh, their motivation for adding all these new features. And uh, we were able to, to come up with uh, a couple of different solutions we wanted to explore to try to basically keep everyone happy. So we will still have centralized infrastructure, but uh, the core paths might be different for different use cases, for example, is one solution. Uh, there were others, but, but the, the, the gist of it is that it was in the face-to-face, -face, we got to three or four different interested parties, and we were able to hammer out some solutions over the two days. I thought that was really nice. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah, we have not been able to achieve that kind of uh, outcome on the minimum. Don't all sign up for number two at the same time. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I see John is very eager, so I'll let John go. Oh yeah, I think one thing that's come up uh, multiple times, at least in the DTF space, is where to put call sites and uh, what needs to be done next on the verifier to make the programs more runnable, um, and these kinds of things that have a sort of a wide uh, uh, group of people that are sort of trying to do different things. It's nice to see everyone's use cases. Um, so we have some idea of why people are doing various uh, various patches. I think a big thing is the motivation behind a lot of the work. I can follow up on that. I, I, I have really enjoyed to, to hear about the, the use cases behind all the companies that won't tell you what's going on, right? So I go hear what, what Google is doing. I'm not telling you, you because you have to get it. Get to the conference, right? But it's really good to figure out, oh, this is the use case. Oh, you use it this way. Now, okay, I, don't, I understand why you try to, to push the code in this direction. And, and so you figure out all this, this different <coughs> stuff. That, yes, engineer to engineer, not we be <coughs> something secret with outside the room here. <laughs> Jamal, you're uniquely positioned to be no, next. I mean, there's a lot of insight that you get by meeting the gurus who show up there. Um, to hear what I think I'll second what uh, uh, Jess was saying. You can hear what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing. What kind of challenges that you may not have a lot of appreciation for. Uh, I don't think anybody can write a paper for that and show up at NetDev and say, you know, we, oh, when Alexi, for example, first presented in NetDev 2.1 at NetConf back in Toronto for the multi PCI uh, bus. The multi host PCI out there. That's just Facebook craziness. And it turns out it's actually industry. We are ahead of the game. We could have seen that. We're lucky to have access to people from those big organizations where using Linux that show up for these things. Eric? You're the one, you're the Google is doing person? I don't recall having said anything. Uh, the discipline. Discipline. No secrets, sure. Sorry. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is after the first yeah. period. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, I'll actually add an overall line because uh, it's, I think, important. And especially if you're not in NetConf to understand that this is what happens a lot. I think uh, the few that I've attended, I, it's very clear that a lot of problems that are facing the Linux networking code today, and I guess more than just networking, is, m is that Linux is getting pulled into n different applications. And almost always, the, the tension is between speed and features. Right? Somebody wants to do something special, they want to do it at high speed, and the person who's, who cares about speed is going, I don't want any more shit to be added to my thing, I want it to be lean, mean, and fast. And the person who needs the feature is going, what the hell? I mean, I just need another 5% thing. And this is a problem that is incredibly hard to solve in a mailing list. Because unless you're writing papers, like Jamal said, it's very hard to put forth an argument that says, this is why you should care about this. And NetConf, the thing I've seen is that it's actually a pretty good spot where people with low resistance, with mostly a constructive perspective, present what they want, and either people say that's full of shit in a good way, in a very constructive way, or uh, they say that makes sense, I understand, and let's go figure out if we can make it work out for you. Jamal looks like he's, he wants to say something. Saying is after a few beers and Eric is banging on the table <laughs> that he's unhappy about Yiri uh, putting one RCU check, <laughs> then you know that that actually is very important because He's going to break the table if you don't listen. <laughs> so how many tables have been broken in past NetConf is the question. I know that Eric doesn't remember, but. <laughs> the point is, uh, even to me, it didn't look like it was a big deal. There's just one RCU lock. Yeah, there, there was not so much contention at this year's event, actually. Uh, 
No, mo no tables were damaged in Korea. So, so you're saying that you only remember the la you have one netconf deep stack and no tables were damaged in that stack. So I'm no just saying that this week was relative. This week was okay. Yes, yeah, I get it. <laughs> it is a week to week kind of affair. Okay, so now we're going to go. Yeah, question. Uh, Stephen. Mike. Mike's coming up. <coughs> the other thing that uh, people need to realize is it's not the case that only the things that are discussed at NetConf are going to get in. So that, you know, if somebody comes along with some magic Frosbos patch. That's a technical term. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, that's very important. It's not a, uh, I think if Dave was here, he would say that NetConf is not a expedited clearinghouse strategy. It's more of a, here are important contentious things that were discussed. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 not the place where you hand me an envelope inside of a book and then uh, your your changes go in. That that's not what's happening at NetConf. Uh, it is your opportunity to get uh, my attention, uh, undivided, uh, if you feed me enough coffee. And uh, another thing to take in consideration is that when groups of people at this level get together, you know exactly who your target audience is and you don't need to adjust your delivery at all. You can just go straight to the facts, straight to what's important and know that the person listening to you understands everything completely. So it's a really a, a unique environment to discuss the problems that you're thinking about every single day. So that's basically what it's all about. Any disagreements? Dave is back now. so. <laughs> I, I'm not disagreeing until he leaves the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was, looked like there was another Sorry. question in the back there, no? Okay. All right, so we'll now go to a slightly more fun version then. So what was the most fun disagreement from NetConf that you remember? So, and, and you know, use characteristics like, oh man, this discussion ran for one and a half of the two days, or, um, this thing resulted in broken tables, or? <laughs> Jasper is trying to get the mic away from me. I'm trying to push it away, push it away. No, I think we've had, like, with the, the HTTP stuff, there's been some kind of the what, are you, what are you talking about? Not, not this year? Or Eric remembers it as everybody was in complete agreement after one beer, and, yeah. Yeah, and everyone was holding hands. And yeah. No, uh, but that's, it's not, this one was fine. The HTTP is like in now, but be like before, if we, we had some some people disagreeing heavily around around this, that that's, that was also a net count, and we had discussions around this uh, that ran high. Yeah. But Jamal, you remember? No, I don't know if there's a disagreement, but there's probably discussions that are not are not over yet. Like uh, I think with John, I may still have to talk to him about being able to copy from one socket in one namespace to another. Uh, <laughs> with Simon, I may have, uh, I, I still have an issue with the flag you want to set on uh, uh, the offload for the, <laughs> you say the users want it, but should we rehash some of those discussions here? Yeah, why not? So, I mean, what you're getting now is probably a unique preview into next NetConf's uh, contention topics, and they, we should be happy we are setting it up for you, so you have your agenda set. Right. Uh, One more. <laughs> just, uh, just to add to John, it's not that I dislike the idea. I think it's a great idea. I just thought, I thought about it. I thought nobody will ever agree to me doing this. <laughs> I, I don't have a specific issue to bring up here, but uh, I do remember one of the uh, NetConfs I attended. Uh, I, I don't remember <laughs> the issue. but. But uh, people can get a bit emotional. The, the, the guy in, in question, uh, he jumped up and he slammed his fist on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Who and was that? Uh, maybe it's not best not to Oh, OK. Name. I see, I see. It's, uh, he who shall not be named. Uh, someone who's not here, so I, I won't name him. But uh, they, they, he felt very strongly about a point. We, we discussed it some more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, is the criteria for good discussion 45 minutes, one and a half hours, half a day, one day, two days? Uh, so for the individual topics? Yeah. So the, it's a fairly unstructured event. So 
basically everyone gets the opportunity to talk, but how long they talk for is, is set by, by themselves. So right, right, my question was for you guys. Do you remember the topic has had a lot of discussion if it went oh. past half an hour, one hour, half a day, one day? What's the cutoff for you guys? I don't know. In my opinion, a good discussion is one that comes to a conclusion regardless of length. Oh, very <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, John, what's your favorite memory? Is it the one Jamal disagreed with you on just now? No. no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you disagree with that? Okay. I just don't think it's contentious. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it later. Um, no, uh, I, I don't think most things are sort of resolved after discussions, and sometimes a few things carry over across multiple net comps, and I think by and large things get resolved. Nothing stands out really. That's, I think that's the beer talking. I so, um, the thing I remember from, from this netconf is some guys, some guy took a lot of time and <laughs> others took <laughs> less time. So I prefer, you know, the cutoff being a half an hour. It's probably better this way, but... No. And also one thing I need to mention, uh, we had in prior netconf uh, confirms very interesting stuff about uh, QDisk stuff, uh, being blockless, whatever. And so sometime you, you, you reach an agreement of how it should be done, but actually we switch uh, to other employers and other day jobs, and so the task cannot be finished. So that's, uh, so sometime we agree to, to have a very good solution, but uh, nobody actually implemented it. So maybe one day it will be done. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Any disagreements from the audience? Anybody who says, no, I think that's not right? No, no questions. OK. Um, we'll keep going along the same lines then. And actually, again, I will ask for more audience participation. Um, a thing that I think always comes up, right? Uh, if I look at the trajectory of of NetConf itself and all the things that, have, that I've seen in the notes or I've been in present for, what I see is that there is a lot of, always the things that drive the most discussion is, are things that have high importance. Right? It's typically quite well correlated. Something that has deep impact gets everybody's attention. Something that doesn't have deep impact tends to go through very quickly. There are some exceptions that I can think of. But in general, it is proportional to the effort that's put in. But one of the things that is to carry on from where, where Eric left off is how are things getting included, right? I mean, there is, there is now a lot of discussion on how is the patch queue managed? How are tests going to be deployed? How are, what constitutes a good development workflow, right? Because if at the end of the day, NetConf is the steering committee, if you will, of important things to worry about, how does the mass audience or the general audience benefit from that? So anybody want to talk a few minutes about things that have been discussed in that conference, things that, that you guys think are important to be discussed in NetDev and in the vast and more general Linux community because we need to move some of these things and some of the directions that, uh, that Linux networking is taking into a more structured set. And I think there's general consensus on that. Mm -hmm. But how, how and what would be the next steps? And what are the things for audience members, questions to ask and to think about and maybe participate in here is, what are the things you would recommend these guys and the other NetCon people in this room think about as things that Linux needs as infrastructure enhancements in the next few years? So I want to comment about the lightning talk. I, I think it's a real good opportunity for anyone in the room, including ourselves, to you know, propose a new topic for discussion. And uh, so actually, actually, in NetConf, we always already have this um, uh, lightning talk uh, principle. Idea. We can just, you know, without having th thought about that before joining NetConf, we can, oh, what about this new stuff? Anybody want to talk about, like, what are the things that we should be thinking about, tools that you know, we talked about NetEM yesterday. There's a few other things that have been discussed, like how people have been talking about TC, BPF validator, blah, blah, blah. But like, how do we make that into things such that the vast 
majority can engage with the sort of the steering committee, if you will, and, and come up with a better together answer than, than where we are today. So, so maybe I can just encourage people to write self-tests and have these automatically run, and we can, uh, at least in the BPF space, we have uh, lots of these, and they, they catch tons of bugs to the point where it would be almost, it's hard to imagine not having these tests at this point. Um, be quite nice if other uh, subsystems got to this point where where we caught bugs, you know, before things are even applied at this point, because we, everyone runs the self test before they push patches. So, so that's a great uh, segue. We'll do a quick uh, audience uh, check. How many people know about the BPF eBPF self test infrastructure? It's also maybe important to note that it's not specific to BPF. But BPF is one subfolder in the whole self-test sure. directory. So, yeah, but given we had only five hands go up, go up, I think uh, that fine point might be lost. So, so I guess the statement here is: go look at the self-test infrastructure and make sure that you run it before you submit patches. And they are usually run by a bunch of build bots. So, if you do submit something and it fails the self-test, we'll also hear about it. So. And th th actually, probably the other way is more important. If somebody else breaks your stuff and you have a self-test for it, you'll catch it right away. Simon, anything? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess if you're, you're talking about sort of hot topics and so on, um, it's pretty clear that uh, maybe no surprise given the, the program of this event, but uh, XDP BPF is, uh, is pretty hot. Uh, so if you look at the percentage of, of discussion at the, the net conf that was devoted to that topic uh, it was significant whereas if we go back a few years ago uh, it was not really discussed at all yeah. uh, so that's interesting and I guess in general things c do, do kind of come and go a little bit um, as, as the features come up and people are working on them and then maybe they go away because they're completed uh, Maybe less applicable to the XDP case because it's kind of large and looks like it will go on for a while. Um, so, yeah. Um, Jasper. Yeah. So, so the whole BPF stuff, I, I found it was like the learning curve was quite hard. So, I've actually put some energy in to make it easier for for people to consume. And I'm actually it is the the new hot topic, like user programmable networking. We're calling it. Yeah, and that yeah. actually means that you should like actually learn this BPF stuff and figure out if it fits your use case. And if it doesn't fit it and you need it, then tell us so we can actually make it fit your use case. It's it's a really powerful feature, and I'm, I've tried to put some energy into making it more easy consumable by people. And I hope like this audience will will look into it and, and try it out. We have the the samples BPF, and it's actually quite should be quite easy now. I added checks for you if you have the wrong compiler, even the wrong compiler version and stuff like that. So I, I would say easy is a very strong word. It's better now is I think the <laughs> word I would go with. Um, yeah. So uh, since you're speaking eBPF, I'm going to pitch TDC. <coughs> so there is actually, they are uh, self-tests for TC. Um, this this uh, offers two opportunities for people who are interested. One is actually they're great learning tools. If you didn't know about BPF and you go and looked at uh, self tests, you learn. It's it, there's no documentation to describe what's in there. The simple code snippets that you can learn a lot by just looking at the self test. The other thing is it opens opportunities for people who are not traditional coders. We I think we could use a great uh, uh, the expertise of people who are testers, right? Who know how to build good test infrastructures that typically wouldn't be contributing patches. So uh, participate, uh, at least uh, you don't have to be a coder if you're a tester in an organization, there's a great opportunity for you to take part in this. Yep. Any, any additions? Well, I, I mean, it's kind of obvious, I suppose, but the tests uh, are of course important because uh, the complexity of what's going on there is, is so great that as John said, without the tests, it would be very difficult to modify the code and add new features and so on without introducing regressions. So it, it's very nice. We have the, the growing coverage in XDP, uh, but there are vast areas that have uh, almost no coverage at all. Self-tests are damn important. At Google, we have like 600 packet drill tests. So packet drill is, it is open source, but the, the, the tests themselves are not yet upstream because uh, 
we still have to make all the sys control for TCP namespace, per namespace, so it's mostly done now. Uh, so as soon as it's completed, we can release our uh, packet to test. I'm not sure it's, it will reach uh, the common source Git repo because there are quite a lot of them. I'm not sure if it's really the, the, the right place to put them. So, um, question for the audience, and maybe a chance for the qu for the audience to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you, Sayid. Um, yes. So I was wondering, have you had the topic of automated uh, testing at Netcom? Has automation for testing been the topic at Netcom? So, so a lot of the self tests are automated already. They run with the uh, build servers that run whatever every patch or every night or something. I, I don't know. We get reports on the mailing list every once in a while. So I think I think anything that's in self test is automated by multiple build servers at this point. So to continue on the, along the question line, let me just ask the question and maybe Simon will continue. Is for the audience members, right, I, I'm assuming a significant percentage here are, would classify themselves as developers. Come on, there's got to be more hands than that. You're not paying attention. OK, so if you are a developer, what are the tools that you find hard to use, easy to use? What was the thing that was a great experience for you? What was the thing that was a terrible experience? And I'll, I'll start this off by saying why I said better rather than easy. Like, you know, six months ago, if you tried to write an eBPF program and forget offloading it, just tried to write an eBPF program and you got something wrong and you got like, your validator just gave you some, sorry, this is wrong message. And then you're like, I don't know what this is. I'll figure it out over the next six months, maybe. Uh, unless you really tore open the covers and started looking inside. There are many subsystems like that. And uh, sorry, Jamal, but TC still is in that spot where you get a Eno mem. And you're like, uh, what the hell was that? Um, and we need to go, are there tools like that that you guys find frustrating, problematic, things that you understand the power of but you would like to see more? I would like you to think about, D Dave is back. Uh, yeah, I just, I just had a coffee, I'll come back. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that's an interesting point to bring up specifically because uh, that E inval, E no mem thing is kind of frustrating for us too, and that's why we added the extended attributes, the extended acts. So now any subsystem can annotate an error return on a netlink message with some straight, say here's exactly what happened in some human readable form instead of just this opaque integer that doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. So I think we understand that that's a pain point. We've been trying to make, uh, improve that significantly. And it was brought up at a netcom. Yes, it was a netcom thing, and then it, uh, the actual implementation was done during that dev. So we had it done within the end of, by the end of the week. That's exactly my point. That's a good example. Like, uh, and th this is the point to the audience, is if there are things like that that is frustrating to you, but maybe there are other people who don't see it as a problem because they have learned over the years the, the magic incantation that gets it to work, bring that, bring that up here because hopefully then at your next NetConf, somebody over here will be able to be an advocate and bring it up and say, yeah, no, this is a real problem. We need to worry about it. So looks like we have one. Yes, uh, two things. Uh, the first is what you're saying about the automated testing is absolutely right. It's valuable catch bug to further even, uh, further even make it <coughs> free. Um, uh, in the project I'm working on, I have something in addition to this where I uh, load things up in 2EMU in an automated way and test the actual packets and error codes to user space for things. Uh, having something like And the, the other thing I want to mention is uh, with digging in and trying to find where these error codes are raised, uh, but frequently I, I just like got the whole path to where I think it might happen with print apps and you know, print app one, print app two, ah, good, it stopped at three, okay, now I know it. Yeah, 
this is horrible. Uh, sometimes I'll use uh, app trace and function graph, and then I can see how it only calls these functions. You know, that sort of works, sort of doesn't, and the whole thing is just awful. Um, it seems like it should be possible with, uh, I guess, like the, the grab probe to be able to actually trace where an integer comes from when it's being returned to a syscall. Some kind of infrastructure that's automated happen on, you know, at, at this address, and I can, you know, address the line and find exactly where. That, that would save enormous amounts of time and debug the things. And even if Netlink has this built in, uh, oftentimes when debugging stuff, it's not some nice Netlink interface that already has the things built in with bug. It's weird, esoteric things that are happening from who knows where in that stack. Sounds like you're asking for a KGDB plugin or something that has metadata on, on the call stack and returns something. I mean, we could definitely go look at something like that. Right? Um, and that's actually a very clever idea. I mean, if you have like a debug kernel, you could definitely say compile it in this mode and we'll, I mean, combine it with k probes, do a whole bunch of things, and have like the debugger be able to extract it and return it to you offline would be quite valuable. Clearly, then EBPF would have to enable this, and then it gets more complicated. But yes, that's a good idea. Any more or good point? I guess anybody else? Nobody else has any problems with Linux. Oh, we have one more. Two problems with Linux kernel development so far. Yeah, so uh, our current pain point is uh, uh, the XFRE uh, interface, basically the um, we're able to configure it, but when it when it's not happy, you have no idea what's going on. It's highly secure, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's totally obscure, and and you can't figure out where the packets have gone. You don't see them uh, going in the policy, and they just magically either work. It, it either magically works or it just uh, goes away. Doesn't work or throws the packets on, on plain text or. So uh, I understand there's a uh, motivation for uh, rewriting or redesigning the VTI interface so that it's more generic and allows more uh, flexibility, and we definitely want to see that uh, come. XFRM. So I think what we've seen in a lot of subsystems is of, of the networking is that the, there is this visibility problem, like what it, where did I have packets drop because some rule didn't match or whatever. So the first step of that was creating the consume SKB interface, which allows you to trace dropping because of an error versus dropping because we're simply done with the packet and we transmitted it properly. And this goes into the area of tracing and annotation and adding trace points, specific trace points to different subsystems. And I think there would be a lot of benefit to adding trace points to the IPsec layer and all the X XRF code. So that is definitely a, a, a good point. And uh, I think if you create a set of reasonable initial trace points, it will solve like most of the problems that you went into. You can at least isolate a system, generate the packet train that generated the problem, and see, oh, a policy match didn't uh, failed here. Or this is, the pr this is the point at which we failed to set the security association up properly or whatever, and you could actually start to diagnose the problem more sufficiently. So that is a good point, and we definitely need to prove that across many parts of the networking subsystems. Yeah, uh, building on that point, a uh, useful thing for debugging kind of uh, invisible errors uh, that I'd like to see more of is um, tons of error counters. It's so cheap to increment an unsigned log, and um, if you can keep dumping a bunch of counters and watch which ones are changing, it, you, you build up the kind of an intuition. It's like um, before we had SSDs, we could hear our hard drive moving, and then we like got this kind of feeling of what was happening in the computer. And w when you can see the air counters changing, you get this the same kind of intuition about where things happen. Can, can I comment on that? I it's, it's, it's not, it, it costs something to increment counters. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the nanosecond area, and, and especially if you want these counters to actually be cross CPU, right? 
So you have to do atomic operations on it, or you have to, it will be expensive to have counters for everything, which is per CPU, because they, they allocate a lot of memory. But, but behind the power plant, uh, not even atomic weight, they're error captures. I mean, it doesn't matter it's for debugging for seeing where things happen. You do it totally unlocked, you don't flush any caches. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you can, you can in, 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 I agree in the error cases it would, could be good, and I think we have a lot of that already in, in many different error cases. Um, I totally agree, and if you really want a good example of what's possible, um, I've gotten dragged into this before. Um, the guys who are very used to Cisco routers or FDIO, you can give you can give one command that said basically what happened to this and it goes down so it walks through the whole stack telling you each thing, each firewall rule it evaluated, here's where it had a VLAN tag, here's where it this, here's where it went through IPsec. It gives you a, basically a walkthrough output of where your packet went. And given that 90% of the things are human error, that it's so valuable that everybody was dying for it and it was it's like, ah, the Linux stack doesn't have this. Oh, this is really hard to build. <laughs> so, I mean, like I said earlier, I think a GDB plugin type thing with something that, so you I know. Want, I want a user command that I can say. Just, this, no, no. This, and it doesn't have to do trace points. It doesn't have to, I don't have to go. So, master, so yeah. Where's the infrastructure and the UI? And let's give the UI and let's build the infrastructure. Sure, 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 yeah. 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 This is the little infrastructure cool, as yeah. you know, but uh, yes, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, just even uh, annotated SKB, for example, right, that just captures, I think Dave, I've heard Dave say that before, just having SKB metadata, just like I'm traversing this layer, I'm traversing this layer. And in the debug case, right, you don't even have to put it in the performance part before Eric jumps up and strangles me. Uh, you know that SKB are going to disappear because of the fixed DB, so oh. no, no metadata anymore, just no bugs. <laughs> it will fly at lightning speed. And yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll add this to the no uh, I, I just have a question. Why do we have to make it easy? There'll be no need for gurus after that. That's a very good point. <laughs> I, I do agree there is some issues with the bugging on the Linux with the, the guys that mentioned here especially drop counters all over the place that if you have some packets being dropped to some your error or something, some router or something, there's no convenient counters at each place in the flow, but it's easily to get at the reason and to compile the code and all this stuff. So I do <coughs> there is some issue with the debugging that need to be addressed. They need to be, of course, efficient on this stuff. Okay, we are almost out of time. So uh, from what I heard, there are only four issues with the Linux kernel development right now, and we covered them all. So if anybody wants to sneak in the fifth, this is about as much time as we have. If not, we will be wrapping up. Uh, no fifth, okay, only four issues. Well, okay then, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here. If you have any closing thoughts. <laughs> if you have any closing thoughts, now would be a good time. If not, uh, the applause will start. No closing thoughts. Applause then. <laughs> <laughs>